Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first session this morning. Um, so the first talk of this session will be analyzing multi-key security degradation by Atta Lutz, Bart Manik, Kenneth Feldperson, and Atta will give the talk. Please. Uh, well, do I need a microphone? Can you guys? Yes, need a microphone. microphone. Okay, good. <laughs> um, okay, so thanks for the introduction. So the type of research that we did, but you, you might be able to consider it a bit more analyzing conventional and symmetric key algorithms. You know, it might not be as sexy as post quantum or encrypting on, uh, you know, computing on encrypted data and stuff like that, but. What I'm, what I'm going to try and argue is that you, you know there is actually motivation, there's reason that you want to look at these things, and you can actually get interesting research. Um, so this is kind of briefly an outline of the talk. Uh, so I'll first I'll be going into kind of why it's interesting to look at these schemes uh, and these models, because I mean, basically in short, you can have a direct impact on algorithms that are being used nowadays. Um, then I'm going to be talking about this multi-key setting and talking, you know, introducing it properly and showing how there are some obvious questions that are still unanswered about the setting. Um, and then looking more at the analysis, it turns out that it's actually kind of counterintuitive to, uh, to find attacks against schemes in this multi-key setting and at the same time also prove that schemes are secure according to some level of security. So jumping right in, the motivation. So a few months ago, Reuters came out with an article titled you know, "This Trustful US Ally Is Forced Spy Agency to Back Down an Encryption Fight." And what the article is talking about is basically how the NSA is trying to standardize their box cipher Simon and Spec in ISO. Uh, Simon and Spec, <coughs> designed to be lightweight block ciphers, there's a whole range of them. You know, going from small block sizes of 32 bits all the way up to 128 bits and varying key sizes, and uh, you know I'm setting the setting the political issues aside. One of the things brought up in this article is basically that through the discussions and arguments in the ISO process, um, the NSA ultimately decided to drop all the block sizes below 128 bits. So right now they're just trying to standardize the 128 bit version of Simon Spec, um, and the reason for that is basically that these block sizes, these smaller block sizes, they provide you know, quite stringent restrictions on how much data you can process. And in fact, the, what convinced them, ultimately, the, the paper that convinced them to drop everything was uh, this uh, Sweet32 attack, which was published last year. Uh, Sweet32 attack uh, is an attack against uh, TLS and, well, other protocols as well. Um, but in the case of TLS, they were able to recover secure cookies, and it worked against triple DES, which has a block size of 64 bits. Uh, it also required 785 gigabytes of traffic, okay, which is, means that it's not a very high priority attack. But what's more important about it is that you know this is a birthday bound attack. It's these are known to crop cryptographers for over 20 years. Um, they are often considered impractical because they require uh, known plain text and they reveal little information, but the Sweep 32 illustrated first proof of concept of these type of attacks in practice. Okay? Uh, so this, this actually convinced a lot of people at these ISO meetings that maybe there is something, uh, there is a problem in standardizing these smaller block sizes. Okay, yeah, it might not be the last attack. Okay. So these birthday, going then a bit further, a step further in these birthday bound attacks, and uh, these are of course attacks against cryptographic algorithms, which means that they are you know, independent of the implementation, independent of the standard, implement, independent of the block cipher, meaning V32 attack works equally well in OpenVPN with long-lived Blowfish connections as it does with triple DES and TLS. But as I mentioned before, these attacks known to cryptographers for over 20 years, and of course we've developed a lot of theory in order to understand when the attacks happen and when they don't. Uh, and we kind of have this very succinct way of describing how long we can use these algorithms via these security bounds. Okay? 
um, the security bounds that summarize the insecurity of the algorithm that you're considering um, as a bound where you know you have this term which describes the security of the mode of operation or whatever plus a term describing the block size for the security. So this is, this is where most of cryptanalysis goes into, all the knowledge, and this is usually some kind of proof right here. Um, so now, how can you kind of make sure that you can avoid these uh, type of birthday bound attacks? Well, you just take your parameters, you plug them in here, and let's say you have a certain sensitivity, you don't want the adversaries to have an advantage of more than one in a million in attacking your scheme, then you just try to make sure that this term over here is small enough. And this term in it, will then describe, for example, how many queries you can make and the length of the queries and blocks relative to the block size. If this block size is too small, in the case of Simon Spec, for example, you will not be able to make too many queries or too long of queries. So this kind of provides the context in which we did our research. Now moving on to this uh, multi-key setting, a lot of the previous analysis that's been done on all these, you know, uh, symmetric key algorithms, modes of operation has been done in the so-called single key setting, in which an adversary interacts with um, just one instance of the oracle, one key instance. But in practice, the multi-key setting is actually important because uh, algorithms are never just used in isolation with just one key, but they're actually used by millions of keys. Um, and this multi-key setting then is where the adversary has access to many independently key copies of the algorithm. So here's an example, ASGCM used in TLS, hundreds of millions of different keys used by many different users. Another example, the Internet of Things, you get a whole bunch of devices in which it might even be difficult to switch keys on the devices. Um, so. Then the question is, okay, we've got these security bounds which we got from our single key setting analysis. Um, what can we then say about the multi-key setting? Are there any catastrophes that could happen? Well, there's this folklore result which says that the probability, success probability of an adversary finding attack in the multi-key setting is bounded above by um, the single key success probability times the number of keys present. Okay, So this is valid in all kinds of settings um, <coughs> using a kind of straightforward extension of the single key setting to the multi-key setting. Okay, so this is great. This means that we know there aren't any catastrophes. This, this means that we know that if we use an algorithm with independently um, independent keys, then we're fine still. But once we start to actually take into account how many keys this will be this can be over here, you know, it can reach up to hundreds of millions, then it starts to um, increase the restrictions on the amount of data that we can process per key. Uh, so we tried to kind of, uh, we looked at this, so me and uh, Kenny Patterson in 2016, uh, we just kind of computed these bounds for TLS and to see what would happen, how much data could you actually use with these algorithms. Uh, so we looked at GCM, Chacha 20, Poly 5, we use, at the time, the state-of-the-art knowledge on the security bounds. And it actually led to the inclusion of this key update feature in TLS 1.3, uh, which allows you to then change keys. Uh, and in particular, due to this multi-key setting. Okay, because the people in the TLS are rather conservative in, the, in what they want an adversary to be able to do. So they want an adversary to have success probability at most 2 to the minus 60. Uh, which then puts significant limits on your, uh, the amount of data you can process. And in particular, when you start multiplying by the number of users using all keys throughout the world, TLS, I mean, that might be a slight exaggeration, but in either case, the data limits get uh, even more stringent. But then, of course, we started questioning, okay, there are these stringent data limits, but we don't know of any attacks against uh, these schemes. Uh, so then we started doing this research, and it indicates that the key update feature might not necessarily be necessary. So, going more deeper into this multi-key setting, uh, we look at an example, uh, Block Cyphers. Um, so, here I've just depicted an adversary interacting with an algorithm. 
course, the adversary, we're going to measure it. The complexity of the adversary, we're going to call computational complexity. And the queries that the adversary makes to the oracle, we're going to call data complexity. Okay? And these are two measures by which we're going to measure attacks. So what you can do, for example, with box ciphers and what we've done over here with AS128 uh, key recovery is map kind of um, the data complexity necessary in order to perform a key recovery versus the computational complexity. So in the top left corner over here, you'll see, for example, brute force key search, which requires one plain text ciphertext and, and 228 uh, computational complexity. And then if you go through the literature, kind of find the best on the text, you can say it's 128, then you see that no matter how much data complexity you, will, you give the adversary, they cannot reduce their computational complexity at all. Uh, or very, very little bit. I think this is a factor two or four improvement over brute force. Um, now, if you contrast this with the multi-key setting, in which now the adversary has access to, say, two to the 30 different keyed instances of AES, the picture completely changes. So, whereas before data complexity didn't make a difference, now the data using, with additional data complexity, you can actually <coughs> use your computational complexity uh, quite significantly. So, up to the number of uh, users. Okay. <coughs> So this illustrates that actually, in some settings, the, it does introduce a qualitative difference. Uh, so what, what, is this, uh, what is this attack? What allows you to reduce your computational complexity? Well, you just simply pre-compute. You take one plain text key, and you pre-compute the encryption of that plain text under a whole bunch of different keys that you choose in advance. Then you take that same plain text and query it to your online oracles. Okay, under different keys. Then you just compare the ciphertext you have on the left-hand side with the ciphertext you have on the right-hand side. The moment you have a collision, you know with very high probability that the key used over here to encrypt that ciphertext is the same as the key used over here to encrypt the ciphertext. Hence, you've recovered one of the keys over here on the right-hand side. Um, so this is kind of uh, birthday bound in the key size of the block cipher. This was initially published by Biham 2002, uh, extended to a time memory data trade-off at SAC uh, 2005. So now moving on, so that's kind of the state of the art for block ciphers in the multi-key setting with the best known attack. Um, now what happens with modes of operations, and in particular GCM, which was the algorithm that we were kind of interested in due to TLS. So here is just uh, general, you don't, you know, details of GCM not so important, but the only thing that's important is that GCM uses box cipher calls over here, which are these white boxes. And when analyzing GCM, uh, whereas in practice you would use, you know, AES with a, a key over here, when you analyze the mode security, you replace each box cipher call by a uniform random permutation. Okay? Um, and now, when analyzing this scheme over here, all of a sudden, Behan's attack, which was the best known attack for block ciphers, is not really applicable because there are no keys which you can kind of pre compute ciphertext for, or at least the keys of these things are way too long and they wouldn't give you any information. <coughs> so, the only thing we have in the case of GCM is the single key uh, security bound, and then also this folklore result, which then gives you the multi key security bound. And what happens when you map that out in the graph? Well, okay, so now in the case of analyzing modes of operation, computational complexity doesn't play a role because the analysis is done versus information theoretic adversaries. So the only thing left is, is data complexity over here. And um, what we can do is we can map data complexity to success probability in attacking the scheme. This over here is just the single key bound. Uh, so if an adversary can make 246 queries, then it'll have, you know, roughly success probability more than 2 to the minus 64. Now you give the adversary access to 2 to the 30 uh, users, all of a sudden this line shifts up, and this is the best known multi-key security bound for GCM. Okay? So that's a, so basically if you want to reach the same level of security, let's say you had you wanted to reach 2 to the minus 64 in the single key setting, well that means that all of a sudden 
the amount of data that you can process under a key reduces significantly. And yeah, of course, node this is a long, long graph. <coughs> okay. So putting them by side by side, we see that for block ciphers, there is indeed a qualitative difference. You know, you can reduce the computational complexity, and it's actually matched by attacks. We know how what happens exactly. In the case of GCM, we have the single key bound, we have this multi-key bulk no result, but we don't know any attacks. We have no clue. We can't apply Behan's attack. We can't. We don't. We don't know anything else, basically. Um, so then, the question our work would we want to do is set to understand this gap over here. Uh, what we tried to do initially was kind of characterize exactly what the necessary and sufficient conditions are in order for this degradation over here to occur. And what we came up with a, was a sufficient condition, meaning that if a mode of operation suffice, um, satisfies this condition, then this degradation doesn't occur. Uh, so we proved it in a kind of an abstract setting, you know, introduced some definitions and stuff, and then we <coughs> applied it to GCM. So, I know, okay. So now I just kind of go to give you an intuition of what this sufficient condition is. Um, it helps to think of Pachinko. Okay, for the Japanese people out there, they know very well uh, what Pachinko is. It's basically, think of it as a slot machine in Japan. Okay, you've got to put in little balls at the top and you need to get them into certain spots and you win. You win more balls, so you can play even more Pachinko. Um, so, we're going to create an analogy between Pachinko and you know, attacking cryptographic algorithms. Basically, a player is going to be the adversary and its data complexity is going to be measured um, in balls over here, okay? And its goal in breaking, you know, algorithm is basically winning the game, getting a jackpot. Um, yeah, okay, so gamblers have to say they, data complexity, money or balls, success is jack, jackpot. So what I've depicted over here, then you have one machine, this is a single key setting, but when, if, you walk, if you've ever been in Tokyo or something, you walk down the street, you never see one of these machines by itself, but in fact, you see one of these things, right? Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, a whole bunch of people playing, and in fact, these people, they actually, they often collaborate and work together, saying, you know, oh, this machine, this is hot, or this machine is uh, better or worse, or whatever. Uh, so they often collaborate. So, okay, so in order to, so to describe our setting, or to describe a multi-key setting, let's say that you have an adversary or a player who has a 500 ball budget. Okay, 500 query budget. Uh, and it has access to 100 pachinko machines. So now, the single key setting would mean that the adversary has to spend all 500 balls on just one machine, because it only has access to one of them. Versus now in the multi key setting, it somehow has access to 100 machines, and it somehow distributes those 500 balls over the 100 machines. Um, now, using the whole no result, what that would say is that using 500 balls on 100 Pachinko machines gives you a factor of 100 su high success probability by using 500 balls on one Pachinko machine. So there must be, so that's what this whole no result is saying, is that somehow the adversary is able to come up with a, some kind of special strategy which allows it to distribute those same 500 balls across 100 machines in such a way that it can improve its success, its success probability by a factor of 100. So this is, of course, very counterintuitive because, I mean, what would you do? Is this ever possible? Well, in fact, yes, it is. It is possible. So what you can, uh, so you assume that a particular machine is lucky with some very, you know, with some small probability. Then with one particular machine, you're kind of stuck with the lucky one or not. Okay, you have to spend all those 500 balls on that one machine. But if you have 100, Pachinko machines, and you know, let's say you could collaborate with a bunch of people, you could try and find that lucky machine and then spend all your entire budget on that one machine. Okay? So maybe you have 100 machines, you spend one ball on each machine to kind of determine which one's the lucky one. Once you found the lucky one, you spend the remaining 400 on that one. Um, and this is, this is not just pathological, there are actually you know, examples of um, algorithms you know, design algorithms which are kind of lucky, um, namely um, block ciphers with weak keys. 
So we'll take this example, Midori 64. It's been identified to have 2 to the 32 V keys out of 2 to the 128, and it's identifiable with one query. Uh, so once you've identified the V key, then you can perform a V key recovery, which requires computational complexity 2 to the 16 and data complexity 2, right? Significantly less than uh, a strong key, let's say, or a normal key. So what you can then do is, okay, if you're in the single key setting, one user, your computational costs, basically, um, let's say that either you can perform this wiki attack or you have to do brute force search. Uh, so in the single key setting, you're either stuck with um, a strong key, which means that you have to do brute force search, pretty much, and or you have a wiki, in which case that your computational costs are significantly reduced, data cost is only two, and this is your, your probability is basically the probability of getting one of these weak keys. Uh, whereas what you can do now in the, in the multi-key setting is make one query to, for example, your 2 to the 16 different oracles, um, and then just perform the weak key attack once you have one of these weak key oracles, and you can improve your success probability uh, to 2 to the minus 80. Okay. So, what we have now is that, you know, you can perform this BHAM rec key recovery attack if the key size is not too big. Uh, you can exploit weak instances if they're present, okay? Uh, but then the question is, you know, what else can happen? Are there any other kinds of attacks? Or, you know, can we maybe even prove that in certain settings there is security? <laughs> okay, so this is, this is exactly what we did in the case of GCM. And what we found that is if algorithms satisfy this particular condition, then they don't, you know, suffer from any of these uh, you know, kind of weak key settings, weak key things. Uh, so the condition to describe it, you need to describe two settings. One in which, uh, you know, adversary has access to one pachinko machine and, you know, for example, 300 ball query. And setting, second setting exactly the same. Um, but in this, in this setting, a friend has played on that same particular machine with fewer than 200 balls. Okay? <laughs> so it, it gives you a history with fewer than 200 balls okay? about what's happened on that particular machine. Um, and here the friend, in this setting, the friend has also played on the machine you know, with 200 balls. Um, but with 200 balls exactly. So meaning that the differences in the histories over here is that this history is shorter than this one. So if the setting, if the jackpot probability of this setting is less than the jackpot probability of this setting with, for all histories below some certain cost, then adversaries will have no advantage in interacting with, you know, multiple particular machines. So actually, so what we're able to say is that by analyzing just a setting which adversary interacts with just one machine, we're able to conclude something about a setting which adversary interacts with multiple machines. Okay, so with this condi condition, lucky machines are actually excluded. So you take setting one, which adversary just interacts with the one machinko machine, and then you take setting two, in which adversary interacts with one particular machine, and the friend tells you that the machine is not lucky, okay, meaning that it's kind of a strong machine. Um, so now the adversary's probability of winning over here might actually be higher than over here. Okay, because over here, the adversary is stuck with one very strong machine. And over here, the adversary might have a chance of interacting with a lucky machine. So this means that actually, in this case, the probability of the adversary could be higher over here than over here. Hence, uh, hence any algorithm that satisfies our condition won't uh, suffer from this kind of lucky machine problem. Okay, so then using using this uh, using this condition, what we're then able to show is basically that instead of this graph being the case, this is actually the case for GCM, regardless of the number of users that your the adversary is interacting with. Okay, uh, so briefly to conclude, so okay, so understanding the limits imposed by attacks against modes of operations is important because of all these practical applications. Multi-key setting balance is not necessarily matched by attacks, and finding these attacks is not very obvious at all. 
Um, and proving the absence of multi-key security degradation is not easy despite the lack of attacks. Okay? Even applying our condition is not very easy. Um, there's also Wang and Tassaro, they came up with some other conditions and other settings to be able to prove this lack of multi-key security degradation. Anyway, thank you for your attention. I have one. Uh, so you mentioned GCM satisfies that. Is that kind of the only one, or is it something that many ski, uh, modes of operation might satisfy? So um, yeah, we, we, when you say satisfy, so there's this multi-key security declaration, right? I mean your criteria. My criteria. The only thing that we've been able to prove for is GCM and polynomial-based hash functions. And it's yeah, like I said, it's not very easy to apply it. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Let's thank the speaker again.